Hi, everyone. Um, just as people continue to trickle in um, for day two of the Makeathon here, um, I just wanted to welcome everybody back um, for the second day. I hope everyone enjoyed day one and learned a lot. I'm super excited to continue the Makeathon with another day jam packed with incredible speakers, workshops, panels, keynotes. Um, and just to quickly highlight um, those who are competing in the challenge, submissions for the challenge will be due at 4.30. Um, we will be keeping everybody updated with um, all sorts of schedule links and whatnot in the Slack. Um, so be sure to uh, stay, on, stay on tab with that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Riva, who is the MC for our first workshop, and she will take it from here. Hey everyone, I hope you all had a good and productive day yesterday. We would like to start day two with a workshop on marketing strategies by Ivy Zhang. Ivy Zhang is a freshman at Dartmouth. She is also a social entrepreneur and a launch ex intern. This session will run from 11 to 11.30 a.m. EST. Ivy Zhang will lead the workshop for 20 minutes and then a 10 minute Q&A will follow. You can submit your questions to me in the Zoom chat or on Slack. I would now like to welcome our speaker, Ivy Zhang. The floor is all yours. Hi everyone, my name is Ivy and it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. And without further ado, I would like to share my screen and I've prepared a PowerPoint for you guys, which would probably make what I'm saying much more clear. So here is my screen and allow me to begin. Strategic marketing in a nutshell. What is marketing? So before we begin, um, I can introduce myself a bit further. My name is Ivy Jang, and I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm also a budding startup coach and philanthropist. I co-founded two startups and a nonprofit during high school, and I'm currently based in Hong Kong. So in the past summer, I was a 2021 Launch X summer, intern, summer program intern, and I'll be going to Dartmouth College for my undergraduate education this coming fall. So there are three things you need to market as an entrepreneur. Your idea, your company, as well as yourself. And these three elements are equally important in the, in, in the process. And how do you market them? So this session will cover why marketing is so important, the four C's and seven P's of marketing, which are the basic concepts, as well as marketing strategies and examples. And then we'll have 10 minutes of Q and A. So why is marketing so important? A few key points to note. First of all, Marketing can help you attract and engage potential customers. Marketing is useful for a customer education because you know what your, your brand is about, but your customers may not. And as an entrepreneur, it is your job to convey your product value to your audience. And then your audience needs to have a solid understanding of what your product is, how it works, and why it's worth having. With that said, marketing can also help you build your reputation as well as a brand image. Marketing um, is very important because strong and professional marketing can send a message to your audience that you're a reputable and trustworthy business and that they should be a part of your customer group. And therefore marketing help you sustain your presence in the market. Remember, marketing is there to help you sustain your presence, not to compensate for lack of engagement. So in order to become a successful business, you need to be memorable and build long-term relationships, relationships with your audience. Marketing also helps you grow your business. Your current users should always be your priority, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep an eye out for newer opportunities. Opportunities means that you can actually grow your businesses and businesses usually thrive through long-term acquisition of new customers and marketing helps you achieve that. Most importantly, marketing is a channel to help you reach your end goal, which is selling your product. No matter what you do, there is all, always one ultimate goal, which is to convert your audience into real paying customers, and therefore you can generate your actual sales. And all in all, marketing humanizes your brand and helps you reach out to your audience. Let's move on to seven P's of marketing. So what are the things you need to think about before you're, before you're actually launching your marketing campaign? Product, price, promotion, place, people, process, as well as physical evidence. So these are all of the things you need to think about when you're actually devising your plan. Who are you selling it to? What is the price? Where do you wanna place your advertisement? What is the process? How are you gonna promote it? All of these are intertwined together 
And then there are all important things you need to think about because if you're lacking in one element, it can, it can actually affect your whole campaign. And the audience matters a lot. Always, always focus on your target audience. Your audience, uh, your business can be a B2B company, which is business to business. And then you're selling products and services to other companies. It can also be B2C. So it's, it can be business to, con business to consumer, which means that it's, it's a business, it's a thing between business and consumers. And then the marketing strategies you have for both can be a bit different. And before you start, there are a few things you need to ask yourself. Who's your target audience? What are the things about your product and service they like the most? How can you emphasize your brand image through marketing? What are their, what, what are their da daily habits? So for example, what social media channels do they actually use the most? Do they use Instagram or do they use Facebook or sometimes LinkedIn? Because different audience right now have different uh, habits of using these social media channels. If you're, for example, if, you're, if your brand or your company is actually selling something that is targeting like younger audience, you want to actually use social media channels like face, like Instagram or link, or sorry, not LinkedIn, uh, TikTok more. Um, the age and the demographic matters a lot. The effort, time and money spent on the things related to your products are also important, for example. So if you're promoting a platform that actually connects eco-friendly businesses to customers, you would actually want to see how much money or proportion of income do people actually spend on eco-friendly products. And this is just an this, this is just an example of how uh, you should actually um, frame your marketing strategy based on what and who your customers are. So do your strategies actually align with your financial plans? The thing I like about marketing is because it's actually connecting every single part of the entrepreneurial process. It's related to marketing research because market research help you, helps you reach out to your first group of customers as well as um, or if not, then potential customers. And marketing research can actually be, like market research can actually be on its own a very effective marketing strategy because by talking to your audience, you can actually engage them and see if they're actually interested. Marketing is also related to finance because the way and the strategies you choose would definitely affect your finance, financials because different strategies have different customer, cons customer acquisition costs. And this will ultimately affect your budget as a whole. And that's why marketing is so important because it connects every single part of this process. Um, because of the time limits today, I'll only be sharing with you guys four most common marketing strategies. Advertising, word of mouth marketing, search engine optimization, as well as marketing analytics. So the first marketing strategy I'll be talking to you guys about is advertising as well as social media marketing. So for, for um, advertising as well as social media marketing, you can create a high performance website where the website talk, talks about who you are, what your product is, what, is, what are you selling, some basic stats or anything you want it to be. And it should be able to be clear and concise and then UI UX will come in and that's the tech part of it. You can also do social media marketing on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, depending on the audience. And sometimes social media marketing can be really effective. But one thing to note is that right now, there are a lot of brands, big and small, um, far and wide on Instagram or Facebook. And then they're doing a lot of ads, but because of the market is being actually really saturated on this, it may not always be effective. However, I'll be sharing you guys some of the successful social marketing campaigns, social media marketing campaigns I've seen the past few years that I think uh, they've done well. And I'll tell you guys why those might be better when it comes to social media marketing. Search engine marketing can also be a part of it. So it's about companies paying Google ads. So if you see on your web browser, some random ads, ads popping up on some of the websites you're visiting, that's because, of the, that's because of the companies use search engine marketing. And that's a part of this entire package. Publications like newsletters, or you can, you can even consider like newspaper ads as um, this kind of marketing strategy. And last but not least, uh, there's a thing called retargeting, and this is actually one of the most uh, one of the, one of one of the most interesting marketing strategies I've ever seen. Um, because in my opinion, it's actually really tech-based. So, 
retargeting is actually a marketing strategy where it uses browser cookie-based technology to, to identify users who have visited a site, but sort of left before they actually make a transition. The cookie te technology allows for um, advertisements to actually pop up on those users' uh, subsequent web searches and interactions. For example, last time when I was browsing uh, H&M's website on my computer, um, I closed the tab before I actually bought anything. So afterwards, when I was going on like Yahoo Mail, an ad on H&M actually popped up on the sidebar. So I think this is a part of the retargeting mar marketing strategy. And I think this explains why you guys can see like oddly familiar ads everywhere. It makes sense because there is there is a reason behind this. And this actually has been quite um, effective because after I see those ads, a lot, of time, a lot of times I actually click into those. So here's an example of a brand that actually did successful social media marketing. So the coronavirus pandemic has heavily affected a lot of retailers, especially large scale ones. But Boohoo has actually been one of the few that actually thrived during the pandemic. And their sales went up for 45% at the end of May, 2020. And why is this? So Boohoo's social media strategy has always been integral to its success. So they use a lot of influencer endorsement as well as social media and engagement. Right now, it has about 8.8 .8 million followers on Instagram. And that's why it enables the brand to target and engage a younger audience on these social medias like Instagram and TikTok. It's fast, but it's also memorable for younger audiences. Through this, Boohoo can actually successfully establish its brand image as being fun, being relatable, down to earth as, being, as well as being trendy and popular. So this is how they're able to actually engage their audience without sort of getting lost in a sea of, in a sea of advertisements. And its social media campaigns are also key. So it recently has like a boohoo in the house hashtag during the pandemic lockdown. So whenever people post about um, their photos on social, social media, they put the boohoo in the house hashtag at the end. And that's why it gets into like a big block of posts under the same hashtag. And this is how boohoo stayed relevant even during the most difficult times. And adaptability is something that can actually be exercised through social media marketing. Second of all, we have word of mouth marketing. There are two types. It can be organic. So organic WOM means that customers are so happy, they've, be they've become natural advocates for your products. And they're talking about your products to their uh, family and friends through small talks at work, at school, or just like during dinner. But then I think at a data-driven world, amplified word of mouth marketing um, is actually more common because it can be a part of the social media marketing, marketing campaign. So let's say if I bought like a really nice um, watch on Amazon and I think that's good, I can actually share it with my friend and using my referral code or something, my friend can actually get a discount and they have more incentive to buy it. 92% of people trust recommendations from a king, a Acquaintances, according to um, a research by Nelson Hodings. And 64% of marketing executives actually believe that this is, this is the most effective method. So you can see how WOM, trivial as it seems, can actually be really, really effective from other people's point of view. A lot of things that come with it includes market research, because I remember some of the times when I was talking to my interviewees doing market research for my own startups, I would ask them, oh, thank you for being interested in my product. Do you know any friends or family who you think might, might be interested or might even want to use the product I have? And usually people would be really happy to actually share their contacts with you. And this is how you actually build up your network step by step. And then you get to actually sort of zoom out into um, greater audience groups. You can, you can always um, attach convenient QR codes at the end of ads for where people can actually scan it, go to your website or landing page. You can also have referral co codes for discounts. And this is actually a really, really, I would say, um, frequent methods for B2C companies to refer their audiences. Here are two examples of word to mouth marketing that is successful. So for Coca-Cola, we all know Coca-Cola Coca is actually a really popular drink that it's basically everywhere. So it's share a Coke campaign that happened in 2014 
actually got customers to view Coke in a way that boosts its consumption a lot by getting people to actually share it with their friends and family. Its social media marketing campaign asked customers to actually find out bottles with common names and uncommon names on them and share it online using the hashtag share a code. And I still remember finding the Coke bottle with my name written on it at a random convenience store downstairs. So these are also like creative, but also common ways to use it. Another way is to grant discounts. And this method, this method has been used by Dropbox. So Dropbox actually launched a campaign um, a while ago that allows people to actually um, gain free storage if they refer this to their friend. And this campaign definitely led to a rapid growth in Dropbox's revenue. So I think that the key to success by these companies is that they're using common methods but they're actually adding a bit of creativity to it. And that's what makes them memorable as well as interesting and engaging. The third marketing uh, strategy is search engine optimization, which is different from SEM, by the way. SEO, SEO is basically improving your website to increase visibility in order to gain attention and perspective from your customers. So search engines such as Google and Bing actually use bots to actually connect information on web pages. And it goes from site to site. It collects information about the uh, pages and putting them in an index, just like I would say like a dictionary where you actually go through them and find the words you need, except this time the computer does it for you. The algorithms would then uh, determine the order of whether your web page will pop up first because they analyze the pages in the index and take into account hundreds and thousands of ranking factors or signals to depend to sort of determine like which web page should appear first after you search for something on the internet. So um, the user experience as well as user uh, interface is actually important because the boss can actually see how useful your information is based on this design. And why is marketing analytics also important? In the entire marketing feedback cycle, you, you can actually um, put your marketing strategies in the portfolio, strategize and make things better. Then you observe how customers react to your, uh, to your uh, marketing campaign how it impacted sales volume as well as the brand image. And here comes the feedback session, how to improve your marketing campaigns. Marketing strategies uh, can be really, really distinctive, but I think marketing analytics can, cannot be uh, sort of ignored in this picture. So the importance of marketing analytics is that um, it can actually be applied to analyze data in order for teams to gain valuable insights into preferences of current and prospective customers, market trends, as well as uh, campaign performance. It can also help to justify the budget allocation on each channel you're using, as well as uh, how you can actually expand your marketing perspective. It can also provide deeper insights into how the, audience are, the audiences are being engaged on an individual level, as well as highlighting how each channel contributes to driving customer acquisition as well as revenue. So marketing is telling the, way, the world you're a rock star, and content marketing is showing the world you are one. And this is the quote by Robert Rose, who is a content marketing strategist. As, um, as I've said before, marketing strategies are, con are Tied, tied together with branding. And then there are four C's you should, you should take note of when you're designing your brand, which is consistency, clarity, competitiveness, as well as credibility. Remember these four when you're doing your branding. So using the most easy, the easiest example is my PowerPoint. So the font and colors I've used on my PowerPoint has been really consistent. And this should be something that is very basic and remembered when you're doing your own branding process. So make sure your fonts and colors are consistent because that, cause that uh, makes sure that the audience remember what your brand is about. And all these colors and fonts actually lead to emotional marketing. Your brand can uh, promote different kinds of feelings going from happiness to energeticness. Your brand can make people feel blessed depending on how and where your, your product is actually positioning at. So for example, Ikea, like the household furniture brand will, would most likely promote feeling, feelings of welcoming or being warm or like being relatable. Whereas high-end brands like Louis Vuitton or Gucci would, be, would want you to feel powerful, will, will want you to feel like you're classy and all that. So the emotional marketing part comes in when you've designed your brand. And this 
is also connected to all of the strategies you're actually choosing for your firm. So always ask yourself, does the marketing strategy you choose effectively convey your brand images? If they do, good. If they don't, go back and see like how well you can actually tailor your, uh, your colors, your moods, your tones to fit the audience you have. And uh, before we end our presentation, um, just a disclaimer, um, I use a lot of free images from Pixabay and these are the cited images. Uh, this is the end of my sharing. And if you have any questions, you may ask and you can also find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, and you can also send me an email. And now we can have our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much for that session. Um, I can't see any questions right now. If you guys have any questions, just like put it in the chat box so you can ask it yourself. Uh, someone asked if you could repeat the four CSs. Okay, four Cs. Wait, no. Oh, the four Cs of marketing includes uh, consistency, clarity, competitiveness, as well as credibility. And usually these four items comes in when you're launching your, uh, when you're actually launching your campaign. So you have to desi design your brand according to like the image you want to have, what kind of audience you're targeting. And then these four are the things you should take note of when you're designing all that. Um, there's another question which is asking, how can we figure out the algorithm for Facebook or Instagram for engagement? Mm. Uh, it's a very difficult question because I've never personally tried that before, but I did look, uh, you're talking about, you're talking about marketing analytics, right? Or SEO. I think so. She's talking about the marketing. Okay. So the marketing analytics works this way. You can actually find like, um, third parties that offers like analytics online. I did do a quick search on Google. So I think monday.com actually provides this function where they help you analyze your customer uh, conversion rate as well as um, how, many, how many clicks per view. But I think a lot of it is done by yourself. So the basic marketing analytics can be done um, by seeing like, um, I think Instagram does provide like user insights if you're a public account. So say like if you're on Instagram as a shop, they actually provide you like small graphs on how well your users have have followed you, how much follow, followers on average you gain per week, how long did they actually spend on your page. And you can actually count the likes as well as um, user num uh, follower numbers by yourself. And I think these are basic analytics you can actually get. Yeah, I think that's it. Mm. Oh yeah, there's uh, one more question. Uh, someone missed the marketing strategy, uh, the third marketing strategy. So she was wondering if you could put the slide up again. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. It's basically the search engine optimization. So. Uh, this one's pretty hardcore, and I think that not a lot of startups that are actually starting, especially um, high school startups, are actually using this. But this is something that you can actually control, like at first, because um, web traffic is something that cannot be easily controlled by yourself, especially when, let's say, your competitors have like bigger websites with more audiences. So what you can do is have um, a clear like website on your own and then make sure the UI UX is designed well. And then later on, when you expand your business, you can actually use implement SEO better. Uh, and there are a few more questions which have just popped up. Uh, what are your, uh, one second. Uh, what are these startups and nonprofits you have founded in high school? And uh, can you talk more about them and what they were about? Sure. Uh, personally speaking, uh, I would definitely not consider myself that successful when it comes to startups, because um, I think that 
I was still starting when I was in high school and I'm still figuring out what I want to do. So the nonprofit I started first was an online discussion forum with uh, three other high school classmates of mine. And we're targeting social political matter matters, human rights issues. We provided a platform where people are interviewed and they can submit their um, essays to us. And then we also held a very uh, large scale online conference last August where we actually invited a lot of um, professors, a lot of speakers, authors to come here and share about different topics like um, Sino-Indian relationships, political manners, um, the political system, economic systems, how these work together. And that's like the nonprofit we have. Um, the first startup I had was a music therapy startup that is kind of like an online campaign. So the reason why this one isn't um, that successful yet is because I kept changing the, the, the business model it was running on. So. I started that startup as an actual for-profit startup. And then me and my other business partner, we actually devised a really solid plan. We gained a lot of funds. But then before we actually launched um, our first, uh, our first um, product online, COVID-19 hit. And then we decided to make, um, to go like nonprofit for like a while during the pandemic because we wanted to share and make music online with the other people through like small private settings, like um, people reaching out one-on-one -on, -one on social media. Uh, we also had like a site, but we closed it down right now because I talked to him and then we thought maybe it's better if we sort of calm down a bit and sort of reconsider like what we want to do with, our, uh, with this entire project. So this project has been held on, like hold on pause right, right, right now at the moment. And then the second one I did was with Launch X, and that one is actually really interesting. I can look up like a link for you guys to read. Uh, it's, I, this one is a, a hardware product where I actually co-invented like a smart pillow with four other co-founders. And what they did was, uh, what we did was um, this pillow solves the problem of noisy roommates not waking up, up on time. And then I think this is actually a very rewarding experience. So if anyone of you wants to want to have like a very fresh experience on how to have your own startup, do apply to launch checks and see if you can get in. Uh, and yeah, these are the things that I've started in high school. So what I want to say is don't be afraid to try and actually make mistakes because right now it's actually okay to make mistakes and not know what you want to do. Because right now when you like right now you have like no, not much burden. You can actually do whatever you want. You can do, you can be like an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur. You can help other people. You don't, have, you don't have to actually worry about financials, right? So don't be afraid to try and you'll eventually, you'll eventually find like a way. Like I haven't found my specific direction yet, but definitely like go for it and always believe in yourself. That's what oh. I have. What are your tips on like running a small Instagram business page on arts and crafts? Mm. Uh, before you start on tips, I would say that there are a lot of similar pages up there right now. So do expect it to be a little bit hard for your business to grow at first because um, I have friends who are actually doing this right now. And honestly speaking, they're not growing like as fast as they can because there are a lot of local um, handcrafts businesses online. So I, what I would say is um, word of mouth marketing for friends and family, which is actually really common for like new startups. You can actually use this a lot because when I was doing like the pillow startup with my other friends, the way we gain first paying customers is by sort of telling our friends and family about it and convincing them to be our first like new, like our first paying customers and that's how they referred it to their other friends their other families their roommates their co-workers and I think word of mouth should be used wisely for other like yeah because I think for a small business like yours it's only viable for you to sort of utilize whatever network you have at the moment and then other ambitious plans need to come later after you've gained a certain amount of followers as well as a certain amount of wealth if I can put it that way yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure everyone has learned something really valuable today. Thank you.
Okay, our next workshop is on how to start a nonprofit. I would like to welcome our speaker, Vivian Wong. Born and raised in California, Vivian Wong is an incoming freshman at Stanford University studying computer science, symbolic systems, and Spanish. At the age of 12, Vivian co-founded Linens in Love in 2014. Linens in Love is a 501c3 youth-powered nonprofit that collects gently used hotel linens and repurposes them to families facing homelessness, families facing homelessness, uh, animals, veterans, and low-income households. To date, Vivian and her team have donated 45,000 linens and impacted 10,000 individuals globally. As a social entrepreneur by day and computer scientist by night, she has been involved with the Bank of America Student Leaders Program, DHL Global Youth Volunteer Leadership Fellowship, uh, TEDx, National Center for Women and Information Technology, and Girls Who Code. This session will run from 11.30 to 12 EST. Hey everyone, can I get some sort of cue to make sure we're all good to see my screen? Are we good? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, awesome. So we'll go ahead and get started. So hi, my name is Vivian. I'm very excited to be here today to share all about how to start your own nonprofit. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so here's the event structure. We'll start off with a very quick about me, and then I'll show you all a little bit about my nonprofit, and then we'll dive into some popular questions that I get asked like pretty much every day. And then from there, I'll show you all a very, very big overview in regards to how to start your own nonprofit. And then from there, I'll share my contact info if you ever want to stay in touch. And then finally, if we have time, we will definitely have a chance for Q&A. Okay, so before we get started, grab some pen and paper. This workshop is super info packed and it's also very casual. So if you have um, any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will go ahead and get started. Okay, so about me, Riva did a really, really great job with the self intro, so I'll skip most of it. So um, a little bit about me, I'm actually in Northern California right now. I'm visiting my campus right after this workshop. And then from there, I also wanted to talk a little bit about my nonprofit. So I co-founded my nonprofit nearly seven years ago. And so I'm pretty familiar with the nonprofit and social entrepreneurship ecosystem. So I really know like the ins and outs of how nonprofits work. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And then other than that, I am a pretty avid LinkedIn user. And I think that also comes hand in hand with because I really like to write. So writing articles, writing posts, it all really comes together. And then beyond that, I also really love to travel. As you can see, I'm not at home right now. So yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Would love to learn more about all of you all if we have a chance. Okay, so about my nonprofit, how it started was on the left, we had just two people, me and my sister, how it's going. Now we are all around the world. We have 35 chapters and we span across 15, Trump, uh, 15 countries. So it's been very exciting to see how our organization has been able to grow. And I also wanted to include this picture because I know most of the time people just see the end result, but you don't really see how it started. So I wanted to show that you kind of have to start small before you um, dream big. So I think, that this really encompasses like how we've grown over the past seven years. And in long, along the lines of that, I want to share our mission statement. So my organization, it's called Linens and Love. And what we do is we revolutionize hotel practices and ultimately we create a culture of care for our community. And then I also included a screenshot below and it's basically how our nonprofit works. So first we collect hotel linens because if you think about it, high-end franchise hotels, like for example, Marriott's of the world, they have super high franchise standards. So if a guest leaves behind, for example, a coffee stain or a pen mark on a blanket, then unfortunately the hotel has to throw it away. So instead what we do is we go like, hey, can we have your linens? We'd like to repurpose them to not only keep them out of landfills, but also so that we can donate them to a local shelter or to a local charity. So then the manpower really kicks in with our student leaders because they're the ones who move the linens from the hotel directly to the shelter or charity. So that's basically how it works. If that was super, super high level. It's definitely a lot more nuanced than that. So if you want to learn more, happy to talk about that later. And in regards to our process with creating a nonprofit, 
the first thing that we asked ourselves was, okay, what resources do we have? And then also what niche can we fill that hasn't already been addressed? Um, I'm definitely talking more about niches a bit later, but in regards to niche, the TLDR is basically, okay, what organizations are already existing? And then what can I do that hasn't already been filled in the whole nonprofit or social entrepreneurship space? So for example, I know there are a ton of sustainability or environmental organizations, which is great, but I think really digging deeper and finding a very specific niche is so much more impactful for your communities because that just means like that area hasn't already been filled. So with Women's in Love, we I'm pretty sure there isn't another organization out there that has our mission and kind of how our business model works. So that was the first thing that we asked ourselves. And then from there, we researched a lot of pre-existing organizations to see how they work and also their mission statement. So for example, I always looked up to Red Cross because I knew like a lot of high schoolers have a Red Cross club at their school. So then we did some research about things like that, those bigger organizations that everyone's heard of, because I think that's pretty important when you're trying to start your own nonprofit, because you can see like, hey, what works, what doesn't work, and then you go from there. And then in regards to the next step, then we started to brainstorm a ton of different ideas. But at the end, of course, we came up with Linens and Love and how our business model works, because it's also really, really important to consider sustainability and also scalability. So when I say sustainability, that doesn't mean like you have to start a environmental based organization. That's not what sustainability means. Sustainability is the sustainability of your actual organization. So for example, I'm going off to college, but my nonprofit can self-sustain itself. And I'm also going to still be there as an advisor. And at the end of the day, still the co-founder. So when I say sustainability, that means is your organization self-sustaining? So once again, it's not about being an environmental organization in terms of like environmental sustainability, it's the sustainability of your actual organization. And then from there, we began recruiting individuals. So since I'm from California, we just started small and simple in California because yes, it's good to be ambitious, but if you start with just going like, hey, I wanna become global overnight, that might actually backfire because you might not be able to handle it with all the different moving pieces all around the world with time zones, with people who might have language barriers and stuff like that. So it's always good to just start small and simple, like as you saw with the picture of just me and my sister. And then we took the chance to expand when we were ready, when we were confident with our mission statement, organizational structure, um, just how we operate as a whole. And then from there, we began to expand via our chapters program. So I wanted to touch a little bit on Catholicism scaling versus Buddhist scaling. So Catholicism scaling is kind of like how we have with, um, I would say Catholicism scaling is pretty similar to like Red Cross clubs. So Red Cross clubs, they have different chapters basically, and they all do very similar things. But then with Buddhist scaling, that allows for a lot more leeway. So with our chapters program, I would say that's an example of Buddhist scaling because each chapter can customize their, um, like however they want to run their chapter. So just wanted to touch a little bit on that. And then now we're going to dive a little bit into popular questions that I've been asked very often. So here they are, and then we will go ahead and dive right in. Okay, so first question, how do you recommend I measure my nonprofit's impact? So I get this question a lot. Does the number of Instagram followers always correspond with my organization's impact? The short answer is no. Instagram followers is great, but it doesn't really show impact. So impact is the number of individuals served, number of items donated, pounds of whatever item repurposed, if that applies to your organization. And then I also like to say percentage of individuals in whatever city, whatever state offered, whatever. So in my case, since I work a lot with shelters and charities, we like to say percentage of individuals in whatever city offered a stable home. So if you look at the side, the left side, you can see that these are all stats or impact measurement statistics that can help you to see like, hey, how do we directly benefit the community? But then if you look at the rights, you see impact isn't the number of followers on Instagram, the number of volunteers. So I know the second one might seem kind of surprising, but I wanna to touch a bit on this because let's say you have a Google form and a thousand people fill it out to say, hey, I wanna be a volunteer with your organization. That's great. You have a thousand volunteers, good job. But 
they could all just be sitting there and not doing anything. So to me, I think even if you have a small team and everyone is super dedicated, very passionate about the cause, then that's when impact really kicks in because even a small team can make a very huge difference. So I would say take the number of volunteers that you have um, and determine whether it's really impactful. Take that with a grain of salt because you don't know if that's actually true impact since you don't know if your volunteers are actually doing all the work or if they just filled out a Google form and said, hey, I'm a volunteer. And then I also wanted to say that impact isn't just starting a nonprofit for college admissions, since I know a lot of people they will start a nonprofit and they'll do really great things with it, but then later on, it will just die. And then finally, starting a nonprofit impact is not starting a nonprofit without a niche, because at the end of the day, for example, there are a ton of um, women in STEM organizations. There are they all have very similar mission statements. They're like, oh, we empower women to pursue STEM through workshops or webinars or stuff like that. There are a lot of those out there. So you just want to think about how you can really customize your organization so it can make the most impact possible. Okay, so next question. I know a lot of people have been asking what grants and awards to apply to. So some could be for funding, some could be just for gaining recognition. So. I think it would be very helpful to jot down all these awards and grants on the next page for future reference, or you could even just take a screenshot. And I'm pretty sure you'll thank yourself in the future when you're actually applying. So I'll touch on a few, like for example, Gloria Barron Prize. I think that one is, I believe $10,000 as a scholarship or type of grant. And that one, they're focused on environmental stuff, but you can also apply even if you don't do anything in the environmental space. And then other things that I would definitely recommend, I would say the Hershey Heartwarming Project is a really, really great opportunity to apply to. I think that one is $250. And that one, I believe like it comes in the form of like a debit card. So then you decide how you want to allocate your funds for a nonprofit or your startup or whatever you're doing. That one's also a really great one. And then I believe Peace First, they do a lot more work with the whole social justice space and that one is i believe it comes in a micro grant so if you apply and you get it then you get a micro grant and i believe that one is also 250 dollars and then lastly i wanted to touch on the presidential volunteer service award so that one is a lot less competitive since it's more of just like filling out your information logging your hours and then you pretty much get it so i would definitely recommend that one if you just want like a guaranteed award and the other ones, happy to touch on those later if you're curious about those, but I would say the ones that I talked about are definitely the big ones. Okay, last question. How can I reach out to you for help if I'm interested in starting my own nonprofit? So this one is just more of like my contact information. So feel free to reach out. And if you want to set up maybe advising calls, if you're trying to start your own nonprofit, but you just have absolutely no idea how to get started, definitely, definitely reach out. I've got my email, Instagram, LinkedIn, all on this page. Feel free to take a screenshot and I'll leave this up here for like the next five or 10 seconds and then we can go ahead and move on. Okay, so now what? How can you actually start your own nonprofit? So this is all based on my personal experience and I definitely wouldn't say that starting your own nonprofit is a cookie cutter formula because there are a lot of ups and downs. There probably will be a lot of unexpected hurdles that you'll have to go through. So yeah, I would definitely say this is super, super higher level. There are a lot, a lot of nuances that come with starting a nonprofit. So in regards to the second step, I kind of already touched on the first one. The second step, you want to identify your nonprofit organization's niche, target audience, and business model. So when I say niche, target audience, and business model, niche is what I talked about a little bit earlier, and it's actually in the next few slides. So I'll touch on that later. And the target audience is who you want to support. So for us, I talked about that earlier, but it's supporting people who are experiencing homelessness, supporting animals that are in animal shelters, and things such as supporting veterans homes or women's homes. So that is our target audience. And then our business model is how we work. So how I talked about earlier with how we transport the hotel linens to shelters, that's kind of how our business model is. And then from there, you really want to think about how you can gather a high impact self-driven team that can support you in growing your nonprofit from the bottom up. So I know some people, they like to recruit their friends um, to join their team, but I know this really just depends on what you think of other friends, but for me, I think it's better to 
really just work with complete strangers because when you work with friends, it kind of just gets all mixed together with like your social life and then also your work life with your nonprofit. So I really recommend actually starting with strangers because that might actually work out really well. You might meet a lot of friends and it just really eliminates that one potential sense of conflict. Like if you just have your social life and your work life just all mixed together, that might not be the best. And maybe they're fun to hang out with, but maybe not the best like nonprofit partners or startup founders, stuff like that. So that's just my take on it. But if you think you like to work with your friends, go for it. And then from there, as I kind of touched on earlier, I would really, really recommend starting small and simple. It's really, really cool to start simple and then grow globally because you can see how you've grown over the years versus just waking up one day and saying, hey, I want to start a global organization. That's so overwhelming. And it could actually backfire, as I talked about earlier, because it just you might have a really, really shaky foundation, kind of like if you were to build a building and then the bottom isn't even stable then if you keep building up, it would probably collapse. So that's my take on it. And then finally, you should definitely consider if you want to apply for the 51CP status. And I know this topic is always super dreaded because filling out that paperwork is like actual pain. Um, but I would recommend that if you want to have like a lot of tax exempt um, purchases or stuff like that, it's just good to have that status if you're willing to invest the time in that. But other than that, I wouldn't say it's necessarily necessary unless you think that your organization would need to have that tax exempt status. That's basically what it means. Okay, so more about your nonprofit's niche. So the million dollar question is really just, is there already an organization out there that does what your organization does? So if you look at the left, that is not a good niche or mission statement or stuff like that because it's so broad. It just says environmental organization promotes sustainable volunteer events. So the TLDR, it basically means like we're an environmental club. That doesn't really sound good. But if you look at the right, it's so much more specific. And off the top of your head, you can't really think of another organization that does what we do. So I'll keep this up here for a second if you want to kind of digest it or take notes on it. But I think it's just really good to get specific so that when you see that sentence, you can't really think of another organization out there that does what you do. And then by the same token, then that means that when you introduce your organization, then other people would really remember your organization, like it will resonate with them since they probably haven't heard of it anywhere else. And so it just really sticks with them. So that's my take on nonprofit niche. And then from there, I just wanted to say thank you so much for attending this very brief workshop. And then from there, I wanted to open up the floor. If you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. And I'm not sure who will be moderating the chat, but if anyone wants to read off the chat questions, happy to answer them. So these are just some things you can ask. These are definitely not um, an exhaustive list. So yeah, feel free to ask whatever. And then I'll leave this up here for a couple moments if you want to take a screenshot or just drop these down. If anyone has any questions that you can like send it in the chat box to me. Oh, someone asked, what is the first thing you should and should not do? First thing you should and should not do. I think the first thing you should not do is just get super excited and start your organization's Instagram. I know I sound like I'm super against that, but it's just because if you just get so excited with making these cute little graphics, that's great. Like if you want to do graphic design, sure, but you want to really consider how you're impacting your community and not just making nice little graphics. So I would say first things first, don't just get excited and start an Instagram account. You can do that later once you figure out your organization. And then the first thing that you should do, I would say the first thing you should do is just brainstorm, like take out a sheet of paper, brainstorm a ton of different ideas, see what sticks with you, see if that idea isn't already out there. And then if you think that you could really pull through with that, then try it out, speak with other people, talk with mentors to see like, hey, what do you think of this idea? Would it work? So yeah, that's my take on it. And then I also got two questions in the chat via private message. So I won't say your name since you sent it via private message. Um, it says, is these, are these opportunities open for international students? 
Um, when you say opportunities, what do you mean? I think they're talking about the grant, grants and all. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So I think that really depends case by case. Like I know some applications will say this is only available to US residents or stuff like that. But I know some do say that they are all around the world. So yeah, definitely do your research. Take the time to figure that out before you submit like an entire application and then you realize you don't even qualify for it. Um, I, can I read the question out? Yeah, go for it. Um, how did your nonprofit help you as an individual? How did it help me as an individual? That's a good question. I would say the biggest way it helped me would be with public speaking. Like here I am today on a Sunday morning and what I'm doing right now, that's an example of public speaking. So yeah, definitely with public speaking, especially when you have to pitch to people for grants or you're giving a presentation about what your organization has been up to over the past year, that requires public speaking. And it's super applicable in other spaces, whether you're doing an interview or you have a presentation in school. So yeah, I would definitely say with public speaking skills it has definitely improved a lot. Um, can you show the second slide in your presentation? Someone missed it. Yeah, the second slide. I think it was this one. Is that what you're looking for? I'm um, not looking? sure. I... Okay, feel free to write in the chat if that wasn't. And then oh. we have a question from someone else. It's also a private message. Um, I'm wondering if filing as a 51c3 is required for becoming a nonprofit or more in general, what counts as NPO? Yeah, that's a good question. So for the 501c3 title, that is that just means that you are tax exempt. So for example, when we, what's an example? When we get t-shirts for Linens and Love, when you pay for those, the tax would have been, I would say around $60, but since we're a tax exempt organization, then you just submit a quick little form and then your tax exempt number. And then from there, you just, you don't have to pay your tax because you're a nonprofit organization. But I would say if you're starting small, I would not say that's necessarily the main priority because you just want to figure out like the lay of the land first. And then if you're ready to file as a 51c3, then you can go from there. But I would definitely say like that probably shouldn't be your priority. You should figure out how you want your nonprofit to work and then go from there. And then I got another question. It says, did your nonprofit help you get into Stanford? Do nonprofits help the benefit of getting into good colleges or getting jobs? Yeah, that's a good question. It's very practical. Um, I would say yes to both questions. So especially with Stanford, they're super big in the whole entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship space, being in Silicon Valley. So yes, I would say yes. And then do nonprofits have the benefit of getting good jobs? Yeah, I would say for sure, because it counts as a work experience technically, and it shows leadership because you're starting something from the ground up. So yes. So oh, what says, resources? Oh. oh, sorry, were you saying something? Oh, what resources do you use for your slides and Instagram graphics? What resources and slides? Um, so for the slides, I made these myself. So that was on Canva. And then for Instagram graphics, I am not sure. I don't run our Instagram, but maybe if you shoot me an email, I could ask whoever runs our Instagram and then I can get back to you. But yeah, I don't run the Instagram, but for slides, it's Canva. Um, if there are so many organizations existing already in the internet and they're working in the same field, how do you compete with them and grow? Sorry, could you say that again? I think you cut off. Uh, I was saying that there are so many uh, different organizations working for the same purpose and they have the same goal. So how do you compete with them and grow? Yeah, that's a good question. So I touched on this a little bit in the presentation, but I would say just making sure that your organization's niche is so specific that there really just isn't another organization out there that does what you do. So with Linens and Love, you just have probably haven't heard of anything else that does what we do. So I really, really encourage you to think deeper and create a mission statement that is just so specific that there just isn't one out there already. So like, for example, if you're passionate about women in STEM, which I'm guessing is why you're here, like I'm pursuing computer science in college, so I get what you're thinking, but really dig deeper. So don't just say like, oh, we, we provide free workshops and stuff like that. Think about what workshops you're providing or like what's the takeaway from these workshops and stuff like that so 
think deeper and really take the time to flush that out and happy to communicate more with you about that if if you're like really going along that route how do you recruit members for your nonprofit? How do you recruit members? Yeah, that's a good question. So for us, we started with just our local community. So working with different high schools. And then from there, if you want to expand like first in the US and then around the world and stuff like that, then I would really recommend that you have different postings on like whether it be with different organizations. So asking them to promote your organization or even reaching out to local high schools and sending them a cold email and saying, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm doing this organization. Could you promote this um, opportunity at your school? Because that's very, very beneficial because then you're asking someone else to do the work for you of publicizing your opportunity and you don't necessarily have to do like all the grunt work. So yeah, those are two ways you could promote your organization. Can you once again just show the slide with the grants on it? Yeah, let me find that. Give me one second. So feel free to take a screenshot. They're mainly just logos. So if you want me to actually talk about one, happy to talk about any of these. And uh, there's another question. Uh, could you give us some tips on how to brain, uh, brainstorm the, a great pitch? Brainstorm a great pitch. Do you mean like an elevator pitch or? Um, like, can you like whoever asked the question, can you just like say that? Yeah, that would be great. And also, can you show the seventh slide? The seventh slide. I think the seventh slide is this one. And then someone is asking, what is the awesome foundation? So that one was one of the logos on the slide with like grants and awards and stuff. So the awesome foundation, I think they, I'm pretty sure they're around the world. And every month in a specific region, they choose one organization to give a thousand dollars to. So like for me, I applied for the Los Angeles region since I'm from Los Angeles. And then every month they just choose one organization. And that organization, they get a thousand dollars, and I think it's like no strings attached, so they don't really follow up with you. So you kind of really have to figure out how you want to use that money before you apply, since they don't follow up with you. So yeah, that's basically how they work. Uh, do you need a mentor to start a nonprofit? Do you? Need and if so, then where can I find to one? Stop a not to. Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, if you do you need a mentor to start a nonprofit, and if so, where can you find one? Oh, good question. I would say to have a mentor. Yeah, I would say it's pretty important because since I'm guessing most of you are high schoolers or maybe a fresh college student like me, then it is pretty important to have a mentor since you might not really know what you're doing, or if you do, then good job. Um, but I would say, yes, it's important to have a mentor. And then in regards to how to find one, there are different mentorship programs out there actually. So for example, I know one that does a lot of work in the women in STEM space. So here, I can put it in the chat right now. So this one, it's called Built by Girls and they write their name in caps lock. So I just put that like that. And what they do is they pair you with a mentor in the tech space. And so if you're looking for that, I would say that's a good option. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thank yeah, you so much for like us giving us your time and we really like appreciated all your efforts. Yeah, no problem. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. And I'm pretty sure like the entrepreneurship team would like distribute my contact info. So yeah, thank yeah. you all for having me today. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to kick off this workshop. Um, it's such a pleasure. <laughs> Oh, no problem. Um, before we start off, I'm going to drop a Replit link in the chat. You guys don't have to do anything with it just yet, um, but just like have that on deck because we will be referencing it throughout the workshop today. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and copy the presentation um, and drop it in the chat as well so you guys can reference it later on. Yeah, feel free to do so. I just wanted to remind um, everybody, if you have like any questions, just keep them until the end. Feel free to private message me or yeah, send me your questions privately. So yeah, I'll pass them to the speaker. She will be very honored to answer them all. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. One second. Awesome. Can we all see it? All right. It's good. Okay, awesome. So basically for this intro to iOS dev, we're going to go over like um, the main like components of what goes into like making an iOS app. Um, a bunch of this is going to be spent on like kind of getting the basics of Swift language. And then um, we're going to kind of have like an open circle um, to kind of just like brainstorm and talk about what like wireframing and like prototyping looks like for apps. And then I'll go ahead and do a walkthrough of Xcode, which is the IDE um, that people usually use for um, app development. And then after that, um, I will walk you through like an example app that I created before this. Um, and then we'll just like go ahead and have like an open Q&A um, and just kind of like work together, chill, see where the workshop takes us. Um, so like I kind of already talked on the components of today's iOS dev workshop are talking about UI, UX, um, Swift, Xcode, and wireframing. So UI refers to the user interface. This is what your user is going to see when they open up on the app. Um, this mainly deals like with visuals more than anything, like color theory, what um, kind of layout do you guys want to use, things like that. And then UX re um, refers to the user experience, which is kind of just like functionality of the app um, and what they can actually do to interact with it. So you heard me mention Swift. Um, Swift is a coding language that iOS developers use. It's really similar to C and C++, um, but I would argue that it's a touch more simpler um, and it's the main language that they use with, um, in Xcode. And Xcode um, is the IDE application um, created by Apple for Apple products. Um, like I said earlier, it's primarily used for iOS development. And then this whole idea of wireframing is basically just prototyping the app's basic look, functionality, segues, and pathways. So like if I click over here, what do I want to show up? Things like that. Okay, so first part of this will be an intro to Swift. Um, like I said earlier, I shared this replit link with you guys. So if you wanna code along with me, um, you can go ahead and make a replit account. Replit is really cool. It's like basically just having Google Drive, um, but for coding and I love it a lot and you guys probably will use it um, a lot going on. Um, but so basically, if you pull up the link that I sent, you'll get to this. Um, what you're going to want to do is fork this code. Um, it won't let me do it right now because I'm not logged in. But ideally, when you fork the code, it'll make a copy for you. And then you can go ahead and edit that without actually changing like my original copy. So I will just go ahead and pause and give everyone a few seconds to take care of that. Oh my God, yes, Kendall, Replit stands. We love to see it. Don't really know what I was doing without Replit before, but it's in my life now and that's all that matters. I'm actually gonna stop sharing for just one second so I can log in. Um, and when we do the try it, um, 
and just examples within the presentation. I will be um, sharing my screen and doing it live on my copy of the replit. Um, so don't worry about like creating an account and like worrying about all that stuff if you don't um, want to or if it's like just overwhelming, kind of just throw it in your guys' faces. So awesome. So basically this is what replit looks like. Don't get overwhelmed by the code just yet. We're about to break it all down. Um, yeah, so let me set this again. All right, awesome. So there's like five fundamental data types in um, Replit. So basically the way I like to describe data types, it's kind of like your letters in the alphabet when you're writing stuff. So like it's what um, you actually use, like put the whole thing together. Um, so basically there's int, which will be like um, the keyword that you use in the code. Um, and an int denotes an integer. So like whole numbers like zero, one, two, um, both negative and positive. And then there are these things called doubles. Doubles usually have a decimal point in them. Um, so they could look like numbers that are like 0 0.25, 1.82. And then a float is kind of like a double, but with more space in a way. Um, so if you're using like huge numbers with like tons of decimal places, um, you would use a float over a double um, because a float actually holds up to 15 digits. Um, so like you might use that later on for like data collection and things like that. Um, in the computer so that the computer has enough space to hold all of this. Um, and then there's this thing called Boolean values. Boolean is just like another like fancy way of saying like true or false values. Um, it's literally just the word true or the word false. Um, you'll see how that comes into play later. And then there are strings, which is basically just text data. So like sentences, words, um, things like that. I'll go ahead and pause. And if anyone needs any clarification on any of these, um, feel free to drop it in the chat. Okay, looks like we're all set on that. Yeah, I can't see any questions until now. I think if everything is perfect, just go ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, some other things you'll need to know are basic operators. So obviously like in math, we have our operators, addition, subtraction, things like that. Same thing goes into code. Um, some of them are a little different, um, mainly just the equal sign. Um, just so you know, these operators are basically used to manipulate your code and do things. Um, so the assignment operator is arguably one of the most important. Um, so you know how in algebra, like they first introduced like using variables X and Y. Um, the assignment operator is used for the same purpose in um, Swift. So basically, if you look over here, I have an example and it basically says var, var um, which stands for variable, var A equals example. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking this object A, we named it A, um, and I'm assigning it the value example. Um, so basically, it might be really easier to just think of like A as like a box. And then the example string is what we put inside it. And like the equal sign is kind of um, the action of us putting it into the box, if that makes sense. Um, and then we also have arithmetic operators. So these are basically the same ones that you um, see in math and things like that. Um, so there's addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, and then there's the modulus, um, which is actually this cool operator. So instead of returning the quotient of two numbers divided, it actually gives you the remainder. So if I were to use the modulus um, operator on seven, I would basically divide it by six and I see that I have one as the remainder, the computer would return the one. 
Um, there's also comparison operators. So basically, if you want to compare two values, um, the cool thing about these is it doesn't have to be just numbers. It can also be variables. So if I like assign variable A to cat and then I assign variable B to cat and I wanted to check if they were both equal to cat, I could do um, A equals equals B. And if it's true, the computer is going to return true. If it's false, the computer would return false. Um, it's very important to note the difference between um, the single equal sign and double. So the single is just assigning, the double is checking if these two values are equal to each other. Um, there's also the exclamation mark and the equal sign that basically checks if two values are not equal to each other. So I've have if I have A is equal to cat and B is equal to dog, and I say, is A not equal to B, the computer would turn true because they're not equal to each other. Um, we also have greater than equal to, less than equal to, greater than, and less than. Um, all of these comparison operators will return, like when they're being used, they'll return a Boolean like we talked about, so either true or false. I'll go ahead and pause and see if we have any questions. It looks like we're all good. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So we won't get into practicing these all that much today, but they will show up when I um, walk through the code. So there's also these main three collection data types. So basically a collection, you think of it, it's just an assortment of stuff all thrown together. Um, Swift usually uses three main kinds of these. So there are arrays, there are sets and dictionaries. Um, an array is specifically an ordered collection of values with a fixed capacity. So when you um, add something to an array, um, it should be within the size guidelines. And also when we say ordered, we mean like every single item in the array has a little number marker um, called a position. Now, one thing to note about arrays is that the first item is actually assigned the number zero. Um, so your count will be off by that much. So like if I wanted the second item in an array, I would actually have to look at position one. Um, I can, we can walk through that and talk to that a bit more because it might be easier to actually see that. Um, but just remember that arrays start counting from zero, um, not one. And all of the items are um, in order. And you can also have multiple of the same item within an array. So you can have duplicates and things like that and that. Um, a set is another type of collection data type and it is an unordered collection of similar values. So if I have all of these string objects, which are just different words, and I wanted to group them all together, I could put them in a set. The only thing with the set is that they wouldn't be ordered. So if I wanted to pull just one word from like my collection, I wouldn't be able to like, say, go to position five and pull out the word there. It's unordered. Um, so you don't have that same um, functionality that you would have with an array. And then we have a dictionary, which basically um, resembles the same like real life dictionaries. So it's a collection that has a key and a value. Um, with no defined ordering. So, you know, when you go into a dictionary and you look for the word apple, um, you would say that the word apple is your key and then the definition of it would be the value. So I'm going to pause because that was a lot. Um, April, if you give me one second, I will send you the Replit link again. In the meantime, if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to... No. Awesome, I think we're all set. So I'm just going to go ahead. 
So now is the part where we're actually going to start getting in um, to like coding a little bit. I know super fast, like we just started and now you guys are already starting to code. Um, so we're gonna practice this idea of initialization. And that sounds like a big word and it sounds scary, but it's literally just setting up the variable um, so that you can use it later on in your code. Um, when we talk about initialization, there are two things that you're probably going to initialize, and that is a variable or a constant. Um, the main difference between variables and constants is that much like the definition in math, variables are things that you can change, you can mutilate, uh, and things like that, while constants are always going to stay the same. Um, you won't be able to change them in your code. And if you try to, it will throw an error. Um, just so you guys know, there are many different ways to initialize a variable or constant. We're going to walk through like the main three or four ones. And then just keep in mind using that equal sign as an operator, um, specifically an assignment operator. So let me go ahead and go to the replit. And we can all do this together. So declaring variables, um, there's a basic format in this, and that is using the keyword ver, uh, ver or var, um, depends on how you want to say it, var. Um, and then you type out what you want to name your variable, and then you use that assignment operator equal, and then you set that variable value. So your variable value can be one of those basic um, data types that we talked about. So like an integer, double, um, float, string, Boolean. Um, so if you look here, I did it the traditional way first. So I said var string example, which is what I wanna call my variable. So it's basically its name. And then I use that assignment operator to say, this is an example of declaring a string variable. Um, when you are using strings, as your data types, do know that you have to put quotation marks around the beginning and the end. So I am going to uncomment this. Um, commenting is basically a way to like keep notes in your code, but you don't want your actually, like you don't want the computer to actually try and run your notes or else it's going to um, throw an error. So that's why I have those two slashes um, behind my notes. And when I delete them, um, then the computer is able to read it and it'll try and run it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is print my variable called string example, and then I'm going to run it real quick. Yep, so if you see over here in the console, um, basically what happened was I called this action. We'll go into those later on. Um, print, I said, hey, go to this thing called string example and it went there and then it checked inside string example and it saw that sentence that I wrote and it pulled that out and then it printed it to the console. Um, so it's kind of like just a fetching mechanism. Um, another way you can declare variables is you can declare multiple variables in one line. If you look at this, I use the keyword var once, and then I have three different variables, x, y, and z. Um, I set x to 2.0, I set y to, uh, to 12.9, and then I set c to 37.1. Um, I differentiate these variables from each other with a single comma. Um, and I don't personally use that this this much, but it could be super convenient if you don't want to do like var a equals this, var c b equals this, var c equals that. Um, so I'm going to just run the code again and print every single variable. So you can see they're all um, out here. Again, the same process as before happened. I said, hey, go ahead and print this box X, it goes to X, it sees that there's something inside of X and it prints that. Um, let me go ahead and comment those back out. And then if you're at a point in your code where you don't know what you wanna store in a variable just yet, say like, I wanna 
um, store like the number of cookies that I have in a box, but I haven't opened the box yet to see how many, but I know that I'll have to keep track of that. I can actually go ahead and set a variable um, that is just empty for the time being. And then later on in my code, if I figure out what value I wanna put in it, I can go ahead and add that in there. So basically the format will be var, the name of the variable, um, the colon, semicolon, um, I do always get those mixed up, and then the variable type. So this is either going to be integer, double, float, string, boolean. So right now, um, for var int example, um, I wanted it to be an integer, so I just put the keyword for integer int. Um, and then if you see on lane 26, I actually went ahead and later on assigned int example a value. And let's go ahead and print that. Yeah, so basically I created the blank box. Then later I was like, hey, I actually want to put a seven in this box. So I did that. And then again, I had it be printed. So, and then super quickly, we're just gonna go over declaring constants. Like I said, constants are basically the same thing as variables, but you cannot change them after they are initialized. Um, so I use the keyword lit. Um, you use the word let um, when you're specifically initializing constants. You use var when you're doing variables, just keep that in mind. Again, it has the same um, format as a variable. So I put let variable name equals variable value. Um, so if you see here, I said um, stubborn string is equal to this string will not change. Um, going to just go ahead and print that and show you that that's the value. Now I want you guys to see what happens when I try to change um, a constant. So it's actually going, like again, I said, um, it's going to throw an error. Um, so, and the computer is actually going to be like, hey, if you want to change it so bad, go ahead and change let to var to make it mutable. Um, mutable. Um, but we don't want to do that. So I will actually just comment that out. And then um, real quick, for everyone who is coding along by themselves, we're going to do a quick try it. So go ahead and try and create a string variable with your name using one of the three um, methods we went over. Then go ahead and create an integer variable with your name. Then after that, create a constant with your favorite movie of all time. This should be a string value. Um, and then go ahead and print all of these using the print function. So I know we didn't really talk about those in the PowerPoint, um, but if you ever want to print something to your console, basically what you're going to do is just type the word print, um, beginning parentheses, and then you would put the variable name or um, the value that you want to print, and then you just run it at the top. So just send a sample of that syntax to the chat if you guys need it. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know. I will be coding on my screen so you can just follow along and see how I did that. Um, and then we will go on and go back to the PowerPoint. And yeah. So.
awesome. So if you guys saw, basically just did the same things that we did earlier on um, to go ahead and complete that little challenge. Yes, I agree. The Devil Wears Prada is one of my all time favorites. Probably know it like literally top to bottom. Um, I just love it. I It's really good. <laughs> okay. So I will go ahead and pause for questions for just one second if we have anything. Um, sorry, give me one second. Can I actually get a thumbs up in the reaction panel if you guys are doing okay? So at the bottom- And there's actually, I'm sorry for interrupting you. There's actually a question about like, what's the difference between um, like typing um, the equal sign or like the dots, the two dots? Okay, yeah. In the code. Mm -hmm. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. Yeah, in the last example that you've just shown. Yeah. Of like the age and the name. Yeah. Yeah. So when I use the equal sign, that's usually for when you know which value that you want to put in there right away. Um, so it's like, oh, I need to make a variable for my name. I already know my name. Um, but when you use the two dots, that's more so if you want to like create a variable, but leave it empty until you know what you want to put in it. Um, so theoretically, okay. I hope yeah. that makes sense to you. All right, thank you so much. Oh, I can see some reactions here. They say that everything is great. Yeah, awesome. You can just, all right. Yeah, so that two dots are usually just used as like kind of a placeholder. Like if I didn't know my age yet for some reason, but I still like knew that I needed to have a variable for my age, I would use those two dots. So I'm like, hey, I don't know this value yet, but make a box for an integer. I'll come back to you and put it in. And then when I find out what I wanna put it in, I'll just use the equal operator um, like I did with my name. Okay, awesome. So let's go ahead and move on to the next part. Um, I talked a little bit about functions when we were talking about printing. Um, functions are basically like the doers and the workers of the code. Um, they're the ones that are actually going to do stuff outside of the operators. Um, so even though like we were able to like create variables and things like that, we couldn't really do anything with them because we were just like, hey, this equals this. And the computer was like, great, it equals that. And then it just sits there. Um, functions instead actually do things um, depending on what the user inputs or what you, the developer inputs. So basically what you're going to do, is, um, basically what happens is that they take an info, we call this information parameters. Um, and so basically they get this information and then depending on what you write in the functions code, they can like manipulate it, store it um, somewhere in the computer, change a class, which is unfortunately something we won't get into um, today, but um, definitely recommend looking into OOP, which is object-oriented programming um, for like a better understanding of that. They can just give you back the parameter or return it. They can change something else within your code, et cetera. Um, so there's two main things that you are going to do with the function and that is defining a function or calling a function. Defining is where you're basically writing out the to-do list for a function. Um, you're basically saying, hey, I'm making you into a function. I need you to do this, this, and this. Um, and the best way to think about it is kind of just like making a cookie cutter. Um, so like, you're basically setting up what shape you want your cookies to look like so that like um, you can use it over and over again. It should be super general and not um, detailed in a way because you want to be able to like pass in different information multiple times instead of just being like, hey, do this one time um, because then your code isn't really usable. Um, and then calling a function is actually using it. Um, so like whenever we use that print function just now, that was what we were doing. We were calling it um, and you know how we put the variable name in the parentheses, that was the parameter. So 
Uh, let's go ahead and practice that. At this time though, real quick, do we have any questions? Nope, I don't think so. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to walk through these functions um, because there's quite a lot of different ways that you can actually create them. Let me go ahead and comment out this code real quick so that we can focus on this. Okay, so the first step in creating a function is that you have to use the keyword func um, to begin. So basically it will look like um, func and then like name of the function um, and then parentheses parameter type and then, uh, oh, sorry, param name, parameter type. And then you make like this cute little arrow, which basically um, is saying like, hey, um, this is what it returns. So when we walk through it, it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, I know that this is a lot, like we're really just like learning Swift in like 30 minutes, which is insane. And you guys should be very proud of yourselves for like even looking at this and keeping up. Um, so if you look here, we're gonna go and create a function called text function. So I have the keyword func. Um, I have named it test function. And then in the parentheses, I name my parameter. So um, in this case, I'm going to, it's kind of like a variable. Um, so in this case, I'm going to call my parameter test parameter. I'm going to put the two dots and then I'm going to put the parameter type. Um, this again is going to be either int, double, float, string, boolean. Um, in this case, I want it to be a string. Um, and then I have my little arrow, which is saying, hey, when I run this function, this function is going to give me back a string. Um, like you don't have to name this return um, type. Um, the computer just wants to know what it should be expecting back. So for this, I'm saying given a parameter, the test function is going to give back a string that says, this function works, thank you for testing with the parameter. And then I, we can go over this super quick, um, um, but at a later time. And so I'm basically going to say, hey, thanks for testing with the parameter. And then I'm going to take the parameter string that I passed in and put it into my message. Um, that's what this backslash and parentheses is. So. Um, again, I'm going to have my variable return example um, um, basically just hold the response that I get when I call test parameter. Um, I'm sorry, test function. And then let's go ahead and print that and see how that looks. Right. So if you look, um, you see that my function basically took what I put in, which is the Entrepreneur Conference 2021. And it said back, this function works. Thanks for testing with the parameter Entrepreneur Conference 2021. So that was a lot. Um, how are we feeling with this? Does this feel muddled? Does this feel confusing? Do you kind of understand what's happening? Feel free to, let's actually real quick, um, put a one if you're comfortable with this and then put a two if you are not. Yeah, actually I can see some reactions um, saying, yeah, it's good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so you can also have functions without parameters. So say you don't want to pass anything in, you just want the function to do something um, without having any new information passed in, you can go ahead and do that. So we created a function called no parameter function, um, but you still see that it does still return a string of some type. So basically when I call no parameter function, it's just going to give me a string back that says no parameters here. So let's go ahead and run that. 
Let me go ahead and call this out. So, yep, like I said, you called it and then the computer is like, okay, here you go. This string says no parameters here because we didn't pass anything in. Um, you can also on the flip side have a function with multiple parameters. So if you look at this one on line 84, we have a function called greetings and we have multiple parameters. Um, so one parameter is called person and we're going to make sure that that is a string being passed in. And then we have another parameter called already greeted and that will be a Boolean value, which will be either true or false. Um, again, you look at the little arrow and you see that this function will be returning a string to us. So don't worry about this if else. I know that's a lot. We're going to go over that shortly. So we're saying that if my parameter um, called already greeted is true, which means that this person has already been greeted, um, we're going to return a string that says, hey, we've met already. I don't need to greet you again, which is actually very rude, but we'll bypass that. Um, computers don't have great social skills. Um, and if we haven't already greeted them, what the function is going to do is return a greeting that says, hey, you, how are you today? So let's go ahead and try it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call greetings and store it in this variable called person greeted. Um, so if you look, I have greetings, the person, um, which is the name of the parameter, and I want my person to be Jackson. And then I say already greeted is true. Let's say that we've already met Jackson. Um, and then let's see um, what the computer says. It should say we've already met already. Yep, so it says that. And then for person not greeted, we're gonna have a new person called Maggie and we're gonna tell the new reader, hey, we haven't met her yet. Um, let's go ahead and greet her. My bad. Yeah, so if you see the computer is like, oh, we haven't met her. So now it says, hello, Maggie, how are you today? Um, I don't know if anyone gets the reference, but I was definitely watching Grey's Anatomy while I was making this. Um, so I added in some of my two favorite characters, Jackson and Maggie. But yeah, going to go ahead and pause. I know that was a lot. We'll go over the if else. But if you understand like the basic function, um, that's great. That's all you need to know for right now. So I'll just pause, let you guys kind of like look over it. Yes, Kindle. Grey's Anatomy is amazing. I'm finally on season 17. Um, I can't believe I like spent so much time watching this show. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to assume that we are all good. Um, any questions? Okay, good. I'll just go ahead and go back. To so there's also, so like, as you guys saw with that last function we did, we can actually control what a function does um, based on what different like conditions have been met. So, this is basically this idea of flow control. And you can do this with like four um, major mechanisms. There's definitely more, um, but for sake of time, we're just going to go over these. So the one that we saw earlier was if else. So basically if is a keyword, um, so is else. And it's basically saying, if this certain condition is met, I want the function to do this. If this condition is not met, go ahead and do this instead. Um, so it's only checking to see if the first condition actually applies. And then if it isn't, it automatically goes to the next one. You don't have to say, if this is blue, do this. If this is red, do that. It's just automatically going to go to the else if that first condition does not apply. The if, else if, and else statement instead is the one that allows you to have multiple ifs. So, it's like, if this is red, put this here. 
else if this is blue, put this here. If the thing is not red or blue, then do the else function. Um, that can be a little confusing. So if you ever have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. There's also these things called for loops. Um, for loops are basically just like an iterator, which means like it does the same function over and over again. Um, it can either iterate through a collection, like an array or a dictionary, um, or it can iterate for a set number of times um, and do something. So you guys will see this um, in the example. If you ever feel like you don't understand what's going on, just deep breath, breathe. We're going super fast. I promise I'm going to show you examples. It will be okay in the end. Um, while loops are similar to for loops, except they keep on doing the function over and over as long as there is a certain condition. So like I can say, hey, while it's light out, go ahead and pull weeds. And then once it's dark out, you would stop. Um, it's kind of like the same thing, but with the computer. So again, going to go back to the replit super fast. OK, so this first one we're going to do is the for loop. So I'm saying that um, for the current number and the range 1 to 20, um, this is the range right here, that 1 dot 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 20, um, I'm going to have you print the number that we're currently at. So the syntax for this is usually for, and then you create like a variable name, and then another keyword in, and then you set your range. Um, just so you guys know, this is inclusive. So it's going to include the number at the start, and it's going to include the number at the end. Um, so you would just put your starting number. For us, it's one, three dots, and then your ending number, which for us is 20. So if I run that, do you want to comment this out? Yeah, so if I run that, it's going to go over and over again, counting all those numbers and printing it um, until it hits 20, then it stops. So we're going to try the same idea, but with a while loop. So we have a variable number example. Uh, I put exp to kind of stand for example. Um, so I put 10. And so I'm saying that while this number is greater than or equal to zero. So like while that number um, fits that, the number that we're currently on fits that we're going to go ahead and print the number that we're at. But after we print the number that we're at, we're actually going to subtract one. So it's counting down. And then once it hits zero, we're, the while loop will no longer be true. Um, and it's going to go ahead and stop. So if you see like it counts down from, it says we're at 10, prints it, subtracts one, and then does it all over again, subtracts it, da da da. It gets to zero, it sees that it is at zero, but because we did greater than or equal to, it's technically still true. So it prints it again, but then it subtracts one, it becomes negative one. And when it goes back up to see if the number is greater than or equal to zero, the computer is like, hey, this is false. You can stop now. So then it stops and it doesn't print anymore. And then for just a quick example of if, else, if, um, we have this function called what to eat. Um, notice how this one doesn't have um, a return parameter. We're actually just going to have it do all the work inside the function instead of giving us something back. Um, so if you remember in the earlier functions, we would say, hey, return a string. But then we would have to call another function to print the string that the function gave us back. This time we're just going to print directly within the function. Um, so there's no little arrow and return type. So we're saying that if how hungry the parameter we're passing in is very, it'll say this. If how hungry is kind of hungry, we'll say this. If how hungry is not that hungry, we'll say let's go get Starbucks. And if none of those are being passed in, the um, function will return, I'm out of ideas. 
So let's go ahead and see what, double check and see that it works. Um, Yeah, so you see the first time I said, how hungry am I very? So it said, oh, if how hungry equals very, it equals very. So I'll say, let's go get Chipotle. Um, when I said, how hungry is, I don't know. It went through all of these first three and saw that, hey, none of these work. So we're automatically going to go to the else and say, I'm out of ideas. That was super quick. Um, that was just like basically swift rolled up super duper fast. Um, and then we're just going to briefly go into wire framing. Um, can I just get like a check on time? Am I- Yeah, actually there are just uh, five minutes left, unfortunately. Okay, awesome. I will try and speed through this as fast as possible. I'm so- <laughs> Yeah, please. Yeah, um, you guys have the PowerPoint and everything. Um, so wire framing is basically just brainstorming for apps. Um, so the main thought process is kind of being like, hey, what is this problem that I want to solve? How will this app solve this problem? Who is the audience? Who is going to use this app? And how will they use this app um, like from the day to day? So I was going to show us a quick video of this app that I'm absolutely in love with. Um, it's called Move It. I don't know how many of you guys are in like big metro areas with a lot of public transportation, but it basically was an app that addressed the problem that transportation is hard in big cities like New York City, and it's hard to understand and keep up with changes. So they actually created an app that lists every single line and route um, in the city, and it gives you updates, information, et cetera. And that's just like the kind of idea of like problem solving that goes into apps and things like that. Move it, lets you plan a journey. I won't play that because we are running out of time. Um, and I was going to do an open circle, but I feel like it might be more valuable for us to just go do a walkthrough of Xcode with the time that we have left. And then if we yeah. have anything else, um, we can go back to that. So Xcode, let me pull it up. Like I said, Xcode is the main um, place where you'll be using all the Swift language that we went over today. Um, it's actually very cool because it allows you to like kind of see um, what your app looks like while you're coding it. So let me share my screen. Okay. Ah, I'm so sorry, but this is so rushed. Um, there's just so much um, to this and it's hard to get it all in an hour. So I basically have this sample app for us. And the whole idea behind the app is that you open it up and there are six emojis saying um, like that you can kind of use to gauge how you're feeling that day. Um, so basically this is like the user experience and um, user interface that I was talking about. This is what the user actually sees when they would open up the app. So we see this label, this, this, and this. Um, Xcode basically allows you to, it's really cool. It's like a drag and drop feature. So like if I wanted to add a label, I just click this plus up here, I grab the label and I drag it in and boom, it's in my app, right? Um, however, there is also some backend parts of it, um, which is where you actually use the Swift coding language that we talked about. So I'll just go over that real quick. So this is pretty, um, simple. So if you see here, I have these constants, emojis and custom messages. I'm actually using a dictionary, um, like the one that we talked about. So I say, this happy face is the key for this dictionary. Um, and then its value is happy and things like that. Um, and then here, um, again, I have a constant called custom messages. And then what I did is I used an outer dictionary, but instead of just having one value um, for that key, I actually put a set. So remember the sets are just the collections without orders. So basically I'm saying, hey, for term happy, there's all these different um, string values in this collection. So um, here I basically coded that, hey, if this button is tapped, um, that's why it's called IB action. Um, this is a function called show message. So basically 
um, IB action denotes that um, the user is going to tap something on the screen and then it's going to do something in response. Um, so the function show message um, has this parameter sender. Um, in this case, the sender, which is like the thing that like gives the information is the button, um, if that makes sense. I know this is super fast. I wish I had so much more time for this. Um, but again, you can see us setting constants. So I'm saying that selected emotion is going to become this label. Um, the options are going to be something pulled from up here in this set. And then you can see I'm using a range like we did with our for loop to choose something random from our set so that it's different every single time. And then I'm setting the emoji message open to one of these strings. Um, and then what I did is I also created an alert controller constant um, that basically takes all this information that we wrote up here and then gives it back to the user um, with this present function. So remember how we have print, present is kind of just like printing it, but on the app. So I will just run through it super, super quick um, with the last minute we have. Mm -mm. Let me share the simulator. Okay. Okay. The one downfall of Xcode is it takes a super long time to load. Um, so I will give it about 30 more seconds. If that does not work, you will just have to trust me um, that this app is functional. Let me go ahead and quit and try to run it one more time. Um, if not, I will just go ahead and close out and hand it over. Okay, awesome. So it's going right now. Yes, it's showing up. Yeah. Awesome. So if you see, this is basically, you're looking at it from the user's perspective. Um, so like I said, I click this button and it's like basically giving me a little alert that's saying like, ooh, I'm in like a loving mood or whatever. I have the crime one, I can click it and then it will return back this little statement um, using that function that we made. Um, and if you actually check it out, because we use that for loop and randomize the messages that are returned, it actually changes every time you click it, um, which is cool functionality. I wish we had so much more time to go over this, but um, that's like yeah, it's, we really understand. Like we understand that coding is not like an issue of one hour or two hours, you know. Like, but we really did a great job, you know. Like you really did a great job, like while explaining to us. And I think everything was, you know, was clear, like you explained in a very amazing way, since, you know, like we didn't have like um, a lot of questions and a lot of people like were sending and like some, some reactions and stuff that everything was great, everything was perfect. So thank you so much for your amazing explanation. Thank you so much for your efforts. Um, so yeah, we're very, very happy to have you today. So yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I will drop my contact information in the chat if you need anything. Yeah, please. In the meantime, thank you. Um, this is actually a last question. If Xcode is only for like the iOS applications or it's for uh, also like the Android applications? Um, so Xcode is primarily for iOS. I don't think you can use it for Android. Um, Android apps mm. usually use Java instead mm. of Swift. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just want to inform everybody of some good news. So actually, like fortunately, Riplet is our sponsor, is one of the sponsors of this event. Um, so basically the winners will get the upgrade version of Riplet. Riplet is basically the, the, the coding software that um, our speaker have just used during like coding, um, using like Swift programming language. So once again, the winners are going to get to, to, to receive um, the upgrade versions of Ripley because Ripley is one of the sponsors of Entrepreneur 2021. So I will move, I will leave the floor to um, Sophia so she can um, like introduce the speakers for our keynote. Thank you.
Yeah, okay. Hi guys. Um I'm Sophia. I'm going to be moder I'm going to be the host for the female founders panel. And um I hope every I see CR Beth. Hi. Um hi. Uh, I, I I'm just going to correct you real quick. It's it's Kira Beth. It's an Irish name which Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Kiara. No, that Thank is, you so much that, for correcting me. That is me. so fine. Um, let me just, Melanie, can you like see if you can find the, yeah, so right now, um, we're just waiting on one other panelist to join. Um, so we're just going to kind of like wait here a little bit, um, just a couple more minutes just to commence the panel. Okay, since we're still waiting for the rest of the speakers, I'll just play some music to um, lighten the mood. I hope you can hear it all right. Can anyone hear it? Just like a thumbs up. Oh, okay, you can't hear it. Um, let me see how I can do this. Um, I think, Sophia, something that we could do is um, if you could pin um, the two um, panelists that are here and then we can kind of introduce those two. That way, you know, people can start kind of like asking questions to them. And then um, if Modesta can show up, then, um, you know, we'll we'll include her and introduce her and everything. But I just want to make sure that we get um, some questions going because I know there were there were a lot before, um, if that's right with you. Yeah, that's definitely good. So I'll just introduce um, the speakers we have today. So first, we're, I'm gonna introduce Joanna. So Joanna Jin graduated from Yale University in 2017 with a Bachelor of Arts in, and, in Economics and is currently the Global Chief of Staff to Goldman Sachs' newest division, Consumer and Wealth Management. In her role, she works closely with the divisional leadership team to empower millions of clients and customers around across the wealth spectrum to achieve their financial goals and well-being. During the start of the pandemic, Joanna co-founded a nonprofit organization called Pause Covidity, which um, if I'm pronouncing that right, if like you want to correct me, it's okay. No, you're good. It's Pause Covidity. Yeah, Pause Covidity, yeah which aim to empower people to stay positive during COVID-19 and build a better future together beyond the pandemic. In particular, she helped to spearhead the Innovation Challenge, which, which provided funding, mentorship, partnerships, and other resources to students on student entrepreneurs across the nation working towards pandemic relief. 
This included hundreds of participating venture projects that supported and advanced public health, education, financial empowerment, and Main Street businesses. And next we have, hopefully allows me to, Okay, so I don't think Modesta is here right now, so I'm just gonna keep going. Sorry, okay. Now I'm gonna introduce Kiara Beth. Um, Kiara Beth is studying psychology and computer science at, the, at University College Cork. Having grown up with high, function, high functioning autism, she uses her personal experiences to help shape tools and resources to help people like her and to help help organizations and businesses to create policies and environments that support the inclusion of neurodivergent people. Her first app, Me Contact, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right again, if you want to correct super, me. Super, super close, My Contact, like my eye contact, yeah, my, my contact. contact. It was a yeah, pun. there were like two ways I could have said that, okay, sorry. <laughs> my Contact was launched on the App Store in 2019 and aims to support people with, who struggle to make eye contact in prax practicing the skill. So I'll just stop sharing unless um, Modesta shows up and we'll go on with some questions. Um, I hope you guys are all, we're just gonna be talking about um, your initiatives and what you have started, your um, nonprofits, and I'll just be asking some questions. Sorry, let me just pull them up. So basically this, um, this, this panel will go from for 30 minutes for a panel discussion where I'm gonna be asking some questions and, then for 15 minutes, there's going to be a Q&A so the audience can ask any questions. And if you want to, if you have any questions, please just direct them to Molly, um, if that's possible. And um, she can just like do the Q&A when it's time. Okay. So first off, um, I would like each of you to tell us more about your initiative. We'll start with Joanna and then um, Kiara. So great. Thanks so much, Sophia. Thanks so much, Molly and team. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so really appreciate you inviting me. Um, Kara Beth and hopefully Modesta. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be meeting both of you guys as well. Um, so a little bit about Posicovidity. Um, Posicovidity was a nonprofit organization that a few friends and I founded at the onset of the pandemic last spring. Um, we are a 501c3 operating in the US, um, mostly uh, with the mission of encouraging people to stay positive throughout the pandemic. And one of our flagship initiatives was the Innovation Challenge, um, which uh, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar. Basically, it is a um, you know kind of a business venture uh, initiative that partnered with hundreds of um, universities and college students across the US, um, especially in an environment where um, the labor market was super difficult to um, you know, find traditional jobs. A lot of people had gotten their offers revoked. So we really wanted to partner with um, class of 2020 and a lot of other college graduates last year to help equip them with the resources and mentorship and funding and partnerships um, for those student entrepreneurs who were working towards um, COVID relief across a number of categories. So uh, it spanned things like advancing and establishing Main Street businesses, um, helping to support public health, uh, financial empowerment, um, and, and education uh, across the spectrum. Um, so we ran for the majority of 2020 and actually closed it out with the end of the calendar year um, uh, this past year. Um, but it, it was a really very, very rewarding experience getting to work with so many um, college students, universities, um, venture capitalists, investors, corporate partners as well to really uh, make an impact across many of our communities in the most challenging time. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I love that you're supporting people who also like want to help others. That's really great. Um, now, Kiara, can you go ahead and talk more about your initiative? Sure. So um, 
my contact was a complete accident. Um, started by a very happy accident. Uh, I was diagnosed with autism when I was 14, which is considered a late diagnosis clinically. Uh, for me, I felt like that diagnosis came at just the right time where I had enough time to kind of establish myself as a person and kind of figure out pers what my personality was. And then the diagnosis came just as it was starting to become problematic and just as it was starting to really have a negative impact so that we could avail of services that would improve my life. But uh, most people's coping mechanisms are, you know, comfort eating, uh, playing video games. Mine is reading university level research papers about the thing that I'm stressed about, which is not always a good idea. Um, so I started reading about what autism is, how it works, because as far as I was concerned, it was a disability that was very profound and people who had it couldn't speak. Not the case whatsoever. And um, of course, there are some cases like that, but it's a very wide spectrum. And I found some pretty troubling research that focused on employment levels of people with autism. And I forgot to read the st statistics this afternoon, but uh, it was a very, very high number. It was something like 85% of people on the autism spectrum are either under and or uh, unemployed. And the same study that asked the exact same people, you know, would you like to be employed? 75% were actively looking for jobs, were actively seeking employment, wanting to be engaged. So uh, I, I did a little bit more research and found that 64% of employers said that they would refuse to hire somebody on the grounds that they couldn't make eye contact, which is one of the most commonly known symptoms of autism is we struggle to make eye contact. It's very uncomfortable, sometimes painful, Sometimes it just feels awkward and unnatural. So I decided that uh, at 14, I was going to do something about these statistics and seeing as I was not an employer at the time, I couldn't uh, work on it from that end. So I decided I was going to create a tool for people with autism initially, just to learn how to make and maintain eye contact more comfortably. And then my view kind of broadened as I, kind of got to know more people who are neurodivergent where it's not just an autism thing there are a lot of people who struggle to make eye contact and I felt like I was isolating people by just saying it was for autistic people only so uh, that's kind of where I started where I'm at now is that uh, the goal is at the end of whenever the end is to have a broad online digital library of tools and resources for people who have autism or live with people who have autism that are free, easy to access, easy to use, to try and break down some of the barriers to effective treatment for autism spectrum disorders. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I love how you like researched all about autism when you were struggling with it and then went to the root problem of everything that was causing this unemployment um, inequality. So, so now we're gonna go on to the second question, which is, what is the founding story behind your organization? Um, I think you probably already like went into this a bit, but what problem did you hope to solve and why? So Joanna, we can start with you again. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think it, like many people at the start of uh, March, 2020 last year, um, a lot of people just wanted to, um, you know, make some sort of impact in, in whatever way they could. And I was brainstorming with one of my friends, uh, Gloria, who ended up being one of my um, leading co-founders for this project. And, you know, we had hopped on a call and really thought about, okay, well, should it be more donation space? What are those populations that we really want to be targeting? And we had thought about the elderly, we had thought about the immunocompromised. And um, I think for me and her, you know, me and her, one really big passion of ours has been in the educational space. Um, our project uh, had five co-founders. Uh, we were majority women, all minorities. So I think for us, it was really um, a, a big, a big focus of ours to target education and um, provide entrepreneurial opportunity for less traditional, um, you know, entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneur demographics. Um, so for us, you know, I think, I think the idea, I think the project itself was less the priority. It was more so the impact that we wanted to make. Um, 
And I think for us, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky because when you're co-founding a nonprofit, it's a very different path than you would take when you're looking to co-found a for-profit business. Um, and in my day job, you know, I, I definitely work for a for-profit company. Um, and uh, in my side project, in my passion project, um, it was something that I, we definitely wanted to take a different path. And, you know, it was hours that we were putting into this, into this project outside of our day jobs, which were already very, very demanding. Um, so long story short, you know, I think we wanted to make some sort of impact across uh, more diverse communities. And um, we had thought about, okay, well, what were some of those communities or the people that had really um, provided so much to us? And what was a way to, to give back to, to these people or, or to kind of pay it forward? Um, so we kind of started off with some of the affinity groups that we had been involved in, perhaps some of our alma maters um, and just our broader communities um, uh, across our uh, hometowns. And then ultimately kind of the idea, you know, really grew into something. And it wasn't exactly what we had envisioned in the beginning, but, you know, I think all of us managed to stay very nimble and we let our um, audience kind of guide our journey. Um, you know, at many tech companies and even some of the financial firms these days, you know, people are so into the idea of customer obsession. And I think the same idea applies for nonprofits too. You know, you are catering to an audience, you are catering to this broader ecosystem of funders and investors and partners, and you really have to let these people provide feedback to you and guide that journey. So, um, you know, to kind of answer your story, to answer your question, this founding story, it wasn't so much my story, but it was really uh, this um, culminating story of all these people that we had involved throughout the process. Yeah, that sounds great. Just having your audience kind of guide you through the process. That's definitely um, a really valuable thing that entrepreneurs should do. Um, Kiara Beth, um, go ahead with the question of your founding story. Uh, so I kind of touched on the very roots of my founding story already. So I'm gonna skip over all the researchy bit, but um, I suppose th there are kind of a few key landmarks that kind of marked what starting my contact was like. And I, I like to point out to people, I never intended for it to go as far as it went. Um, I'm really glad it has been so successful. I consider it successful. I'm really glad it's helped people. Um, and I'm so grateful to kind of have an idea of where I want my life to go in the broader scheme of things. But um, Basically, it kind of started off where I decided as a 14 year old who didn't have a laptop or a computer, I had a tablet and a phone and who had some loose experience with computer in that I had used Microsoft Word that I decided I was going to build an app to solve an employment issue, which uh, looking back on it, I'm not surprised the adults in my life gave me the looks that they did. Uh, I kind of tried many different routes to try and get what I needed. Initially, what was stuck in my head was, okay, laptop. Can't code without a laptop. Can't code without access to one. So uh, I went and said, right, well, for laptop, I need funding. I don't have a spare 500 euro. I, I'm living in Ireland, so hence the uh, probably slightly different accent to what some of you are used to hearing and currency differences where uh, I, I didn't have 500 euro as a 14 year old to buy a new laptop. That just was one of the realities of it. So I decided, right, I will pitch to funders. And the first meeting I had was with, we have organizations here called the local enterprise office. And their job is to help entrepreneurs get their work up off the ground at the very, very beginning at the local start of their initiative. So I thought, fantastic did a little bit of research on their website found a grant that would have been in my eyes perfect ticked all the boxes for my contact my contact ticked all the boxes for it and I went into the office sat down in front of the gentleman who was performing the interview I have since learned that it is not uncommon for a straight white middle-aged man to be sitting in front of you in these situations um and gave him the pitch. I had a pitch deck prepared. I had a business plan prepared. I had the financial kind of income expectations and outgoings all printed out, nice folder, 
handed it over to him and he didn't even look at it and he just looked at me and said you are 14 you are autistic and you're a girl what makes you think that you could do something like this and I won't lie I left that meeting I held it together <laughs> I like to really hammer it home I held it together until I walked out the front door of that building and then I was a hot mess express I was like bawling my eyes out absolutely devastated because this was the first time anyone had ever told me that being a girl or being autistic or being 14 was a limit I hadn't seen it that way before I had just seen them as okay yeah they're, they're they are separate to the work I do uh, it's just about the person doing the work I, I couldn't understand why when I had all of the documents documents that I know of some adults who have gone into these meetings without I just could not understand it. And in that moment, I went into, there was a kind of co-working space that I was based out of. I was interning in at the time and I went in visibly upset. And one of the ladies working on a, another project came over to me and asked me what was wrong. And I explained, she said, my contact is your baby. Some people are going to tell you that it is ugly. Just because they say it doesn't mean it is true. And that was really the moment that kind of kick-started, lit that fire in me to go, okay, guess we're going to prove some people wrong. And he wasn't the first investor to say no. He definitely won't be the last to say no to me. No is a part of the process, but it was just the way in which the no was delivered. So from there, my contact went on, became a science fair project, did well there, became a business boot camp project, did well there and has traveled the world since. I've been to the UNESCO Youth Forum where I got to speak uh, in front of a ridiculous amount of individuals. I've been to New York with it, got to uh, experience the We Are Family Foundation 3. Dash program, which was just beyond amazing. If any of you are eligible to apply, 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 it is wonderful. Uh, got to do a whole host of other things, got to do a TEDx talk in which I just accomplished many dreams, which was real, unreal. Yeah, that was amazing. I love how you bounce back from such a setback, well, a setback from someone who obviously did not know what they were saying because you're amazing and now you've succeeded. So, um, and you will continue to succeed in the future, definitely. And the next question we're going to go on is, um, what are some important first steps before taking action on an issue you care about? So Joanna, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I would probably say two things. Um, I think the first one people are generally pr pretty familiar with. Um, it's really, you know, if you're establishing a business, a nonprofit, any type of service, really think through the value proposition of your product. Um, I think people sometimes have too much of an ego and they can't seem to set it down because they're, they think, you know, their product is the best product out there. And I think you really have to do your research. Um, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, Kara Beth did a lot of her research in the autism space and in the employment space. And I think a lot of people will start off with an idea. They survey their friends, which may be a very biased thing to do. Um, but you really have to establish, is the pain point that I'm feeling something that's widely shared across this market? And you know, if it's not, then you kind of have to make the decision, do I want to target a very niche market here? Is it kind of worth all the sweat, blood, and tears? Or you know, if you're going to try to be more, a little bit more business-minded about it, then um, you know, what, is that, what is that pain point that you're trying to get across? And how are you going to deliver that value proposition? Um, so as I mentioned a little earlier, um, you know, at my current company, Goldman Sachs, and many other great tech companies out there like Amazon, and even in the nonprofit space, you know, while the customer base is different, it may be a customer, it may be a client, it may just be um, a partner. Uh, people share this obsession over figuring out how can we tailor our products and our services to. Uh, those customers. And I think it's really important to think through the value proposition, and how you're delivering that. Um, I think, you know, a lot of founders um, learn along the way that you really need to be humble enough to shape that product or that vision and to take the feedback of your audience to a place where 
what you had set out for may be a completely different picture from what it ends up being. And that's okay, because that's part of the evolution. It's part of the journey. Um, and I think that probably the second thing I would say, uh, which I honestly did not have much of a background in, and that's why they always say to have a lawyer friend, um, is really the legal and regulatory uh, environment. Um, you know, it, it obviously is very different in the US compared to Ireland, compared to other parts of the world. Um, you definitely do have to do your research. You don't have to be a lawyer, of course, but um, you know whether it's figuring out things like, okay, well, what are the tax frameworks that you need to operate around? What are some of those corporate um, considerations on if, if you're trying to form more of a nonprofit uh, organization, you know, are you going to pursue it through a 501c3 application or are you going to be fiscally sponsored by an existing organization? So, um, you know, I'm not much of a legal expert myself and I'm clearly far from it still, but um, it's definitely good to read up on those things before you even start uh, building out the organization. Yeah, definitely. The market is so large these days, so it's definitely good to do your research. And um, Kiara, go ahead. Kiara Beth, go ahead. Uh, so just basically, I would like to uh, agree with Joanna and everything she just said. Uh, a couple of other things that are probably worth doing. Uh, when you come up with a business name, an organization name, a project name, uh, look and see, can you save the Gmail address for it? Uh, you don't have to do anything with it immediately. I've got a few of them that I'm sitting on that I plan to use in the next six months, but I would have kind of started at the start of the pandemic, kind of acquiring those Gmail names. The same goes for website domains. Um, usually the domain names are actually not expensive. It's usually the building and the hosting. Like I think some of the .com domains you can get for less than $2. Um, also, there's a lot of emotional preparation that is probably worth looking at. Um, I found I was very underprepared myself, just mentally and emotionally for what was incoming. Obviously, you're going to hear the word no a lot. You're going to disagree with a lot of people. You're going to end up, it'll feel a lot of the time like you are crashing into wall after wall after wall and you will overcome an obstacle and you will be confronted with another. So kind of building up your resilience Um kind of building up on your knowing yourself knowing your own limits and setting boundaries of okay I'm working nine to five and then I will do my project from six until ten but that's it I am turning off my laptop at that time and sticking to that and um, it's really easy in the early days to get very invested in a project and to be working insane hours going you know from I think they're in the early days of my contact. I definitely did not take this as advice. I'd be going from six in the morning until kind of midnight, which uh, not enough sleep for a 14 year old and definitely not enough downtime, but make sure you're setting those boundaries with yourself, with others, stay on top of your emotional health. And then all of the more practical businessy, legally stuff that Joanna was talking about is all good too. Yeah, definitely. I know how it's really motivating at the beginning to start something that you're really passionate about, but it's really easy to like burn out after working for so, so many hours. Okay, so we're going to go to the next question, which is, what is your best advice for gaining more traction and support for your initiative? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think my biggest takeaway from this would be I'm a real big believer of the power of networks, um, power of your personal network, professional network. You know, you're building a business. Um, you never know who might be helpful to you. And, you know, it's a matter of, um, I remember when I was going through this and of course we were all in quarantine. So there's only so many people that you can meet and talk to, but it's really, uh, I think the, the power of belief in ideas and spreading the word and getting people's thoughts on things. Um, you know, it's, I, I would say stay humble yet. Don't be afraid to talk about your ideas. Don't be afraid to ask people to kind of, um, you know, poke holes and kind of play devil's advocate, especially when you're in that, um, idea generating stage. And, um, you know, in, in my current job right now, you know, we are building a business despite being a 
super large organization with tens of thousands of people, um, you know, we are building a startup within the um, financial uh, health and well-being space. And, um, you know, I really would say learn to perfect your elevator pitch because you have no idea when you'll be caught off guard and have to deliver it. Um, literally it could be an elevator. So you kind of have to just get it down and make, keep it punchy. Um, and, and I remember I was kind of telling everybody about the idea. I, I know sometimes depending on the secrecy of the project, you might not be able to reveal too much, but honestly, I think I found myself to be a beneficiary of revealing more about my project because you'd be surprised how much will, people are willing to open up about their ideas. And quite frankly, if you're open to that feedback, it can really take you um, a long way. And it, and it kind of gives you a lot of shortcuts along the way too. So, um, you know, I, I feel really fortunate that I'm here with you all today because I was invited by Molly, who um, I had reached out to super randomly on LinkedIn um, about a year and a half ago today. And I, I did so with many of, um, you know, peers across different universities and, you know, it all comes full circle, you know, what, what you put in, you're going to get back. And it's kind of, I think you want to help others, you know, help themselves. And I think that's what it is. Like you, I think everybody wants to be in the business of not just expanding their network, but kind of expanding their network, helping people get better because through people, through helping people get better at what they're going to do, it's going to make your network all the more robust. And it's really gonna make, you know, it's, it, they really say, you know, like you really are defined by who you know and who is there to kind of support you. And of course, through networks of women, through networks of, um, you know, women founders, it's a really, really powerful thing. And I'm a big fan of cold calling, cold emailing, because you never know where it's gonna take you down the line. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that definitely when you network, you also have to like give back to the person you're networking with. Don't just think about like what you're going to gain from the network. Definitely like help them out as well. Um, so since we're we're pretty short on time, but um, Kiara, go ahead on the Kiara Beth, please go ahead on the question as well. Oh, the elevator pitches and cold calling. <laughs> Definitely know your elevator pitch, know it inside and out, know it backwards and be able to condense it into less than three sentences, be able to expand on it to a 20 minute pitch. Those kind of 30 seconds to a minute of pitching are going to be your backbone. They are going to be the thing that when your brain freezes and you are in a meeting and someone asks you what you do, you should be able to recall it from the depths of your memory easier than your own name cold calling always just always look for people who are in your field be it in a university level a lot of universities have professors and lecturers and um, email addresses available online for the public to access uh, linkedin is going to be a just mine of gems and then also a big mistake i made at the very beginning was making I felt very competitive and very possessive of my contact and the way I was looking at it which was in my opinion completely the wrong way to look at it was if I wasn't careful and I shared too much someone could run away with it and take it away and how could I be better than the other autism products and the other when in reality we're all a lot better off if we kind of approach each other and go, hey, let's collaborate. You have this really good aspect of your thing and my thing is really good at this. Let's talk about how we can help each other build on and build forward. I'm a big believer of as well, when you get to where you want to be or even halfway there, or even just one step up the ladder, turn around and next, help the next person in line, find somebody who was you six months ago, a year ago and bring them along with you do whatever you can to support your community the people around you people you know people you don't just be nice to everyone as well just don't get walked on that's that's the that's the caveat there yeah definitely I think like having the same audience as another like organization it's really definitely like it feels like competition, but it's, I think um, it's always good to just not like take the audience from each other and kind of like help each other out and build each other up. Okay, the next question is, 
how do you balance your job slash education, running an organization, and your personal life? Yeah, um, it's definitely a challenging question. Uh, I mean, currently, and I think the pandemic has definitely changed the dynamic in many ways, I will say. And, you know, there are definitely, as much as the pandemic was kind of this experiment that nobody wanted to run, but we still ran anyway, I think there are a lot of key elements that we are able to take into our hopefully post pandemic lives now. Um, how do I balance things? Um, I would say my day job currently, I work quite a bit. I work probably 14, 15 hour days um, in my current day job. And then um, I guess fortunately or, or not so fortunately anymore, I, I, I'm no longer actively running my nonprofit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we closed it out at the start of, uh, at the end of um, last calendar year. So, and, and I think I just want to make a point here where, um, you know, not everything has to last forever. Sometimes good things have this expiration date and you were able to achieve what you needed to achieve in that time. And once you were able to, it's okay to kind of close the book and move on and start something new if you want, if you want, want to. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of work-life balance, it's a very deliberate thing for me, I would say, in terms of balancing my very demanding um job that I was working and then I was probably doing part-time hours on this nonprofit I was running. And then of course, you know, seeing friends, seeing family, um, it, it is definitely tricky at times, but I think like any other thing that you're doing, you kind of have to treat that personal life aspect as a bit of a job. Like it, it sounds kind of counterintuitive and nobody wants to make, you know, um, seeing your friend be a chore, but nest, but you kind of have to think through, you know, th there are elements where, okay, Friday nights, that's definitely saved for, um, you know, my boyfriend and I like to cook and we'll, you know, definitely take time out and, and do that every other weekend. I see my parents. Um, so it, it's almost like I schedule it in, um, but in not a, it, it's, it's not meant to be, um, it's not supposed to add to the to the schedule or the workload necessarily, but I would say I keep things very compartmentalized, and it allows me to be able to allocate um, a balanced distribution um, so that I'm not kind of overweighing one thing or over the other. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like when um, you're planning things out, when you don't have like a specific time, like for your downtime, you can just get caught up in work again. Um, so that's definitely a good um, suggestion. Um, Kiara Beth, you can go ahead with this question. No, I, I definitely relate to what Joanna says about like, it really is a case of you have to sit down and go actually no, this needs to be a priority for me this week or uh, this section of time is going to be allocated to this activity for me it was also kind of a case of I have a lot of other medical issues that love to uh, make life interesting let's put it that way uh, in other words I spend a lot of time in and around hospitals when I would much rather be literally anywhere else so it was very much a case that I was told kind of you've got to slow down and you've if it if something takes longer to achieve but you stay healthy both mentally and physically in the end that's much better off than you getting halfway to where you want to be because you were pushing too hard too fast uh, for me another thing that has actually been really useful too is uh, occasionally my friends and I will at, especially at the moment we're still all working from home here is uh, one of my very good friends and I were both fully vaccinated she lives on her own I'm kind of exposed to three people my mom my dad and my sister who I live with uh, we made the educated decision that every now and again for a few days during the week I would actually go and stay with her and during the day we would work and it was like a co-working space in her kitchen and then in the evenings we've got that extra chunk of time that we wouldn't ordinarily have to actually see each other and talk to each other and just get to kind of unplug and rewind there's a lot to be said for you know my phone automatically turns on do not disturb at 10 o'clock every night so that way I can choose what level of activity I have there are some nights where I need to be in bed at half nine there are some nights where I will work until two it's kind of one of those things that you've got to learn to be flexible with but you've also got to learn to be intentional about it 
Yeah, that sounds really like really good advice. Okay, since we're nearing the end time, uh, maybe just um, one last question, just what is one piece of advice you would give to someone who wants to make an impact and is just starting out? So, Joanna? Yeah, definitely a loaded question, but I'll try my best with it. Um, I'd say just do it. You know, I think the, at least for me, I found myself in kind of this like analysis paralysis, trying to figure out, do I do it? Is this the best idea? You know, I'm thinking ABC, but um, you know, I've kind of talked it through with others and maybe they've come up with, um, good reasons why I shouldn't or why not, my, why it might not work. I would say, don't waste your time, um, deliberating on whether your idea is a good one or not. You know, sometimes the success factor that we're going for will evolve. And, um, and, and I think you need to, we all need to be prepared that it will change over time. So surround yourself with really helpful mentors and partners and customers who will provide that constructive feedback um, and you know, be prepared to kind of consistently iterate that time after time to make sure that you are um, tailoring to your customer's needs. And then one last thing that I'd really just like to echo um, from Kira Beth actually, and, and she said this, and I think it's so powerful. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't tell yourself no, you know, leave that to other people to tell you no, but definitely do not be the one to actively tell yourself no and, and just go for it. Yeah, that's really great advice. So we, we're nearing the end time, but Kiara, please give us your quick piece of, of advice. I'm going to talk as quickly as I can. So hopefully people will be able to understand me and um, kind of, it's very difficult to boil it all down to one piece of advice. I could probably write a book of that is just a list of things that I found helpful and things I didn't find helpful. Uh, kind of the two main things that always stick with me. Uh, one was said to me by a very, very good friend of mine who has the benefit of about 10 years on me. So uh, she's had a little bit more life experience, but uh, she kind of said to me, comparison is the thief of joy and pressure is for tires. So while we can look at how other people's work is great and how we could incorporate that, we shouldn't be looking at our own work and going, oh, mine's worse because mine's less developed. I'm at an earlier point. Uh, don't put yourself under that pressure to be the same as somebody else it might not be worse it might just be different and that's often the case we often tell ourselves we're worse when in actual fact we're different then the other thing that I really wish more girls were told don't apologize for taking up space you do not owe anyone anything for being in a room they should be grateful to have you and the sooner that you can kind of teach yourself that attitude the sooner that someone tells you that the sooner that you can learn that the sooner that you're going to feel a little bit more comfortable it doesn't cure imposter syndrome I mean I'm 21 I'm not even finished my degree I'm not even sure I should be talking to you right now in the back of my head but just knowing that you don't owe anyone an apology because you think somebody else should be there you are entitled and you deserve to be in whatever room you get yourself into and you're more than capable of doing anything you want to do. Yeah, thank you so much for your advice. And thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. But um, I was so happy to learn so much from you guys. And I was really inspired by how you guys both solved some really pressing issues with your initiative and your drive and motivation. Um, so I'm just thank you again. So um, um, I'll just pass it on back to Molly or Melanie, and we can start the next keynote. But thank you guys for being here. Thanks for having us.